It's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 85 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Italian roast. Yes, it is. And that's for a reason. Yeah. We need some (laughs) strong caffeine. So are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubbly Farms. This month, you can receive 25% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus all products ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubbly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein. It's perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot be combined with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubbly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code COFFEELADIES25. Try it today. Okay, so Holly Ann, how are you doing today? Great. It's super hot outside, though. We've got fans in coops and in the garage. Yeah. This is what I like to say. It's not just hot. It's hot. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And humid. And humid. We both have our hair up in buns, hon. That's what you say in Baltimore. Yeah. And we're in the recording studio where it's nice and cool. And we do have a live audience. This this is like a chicken cave. Oh, yeah. We have Gertie with us this week. Yeah. So if you hear some little pop, 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 pop. That's Gertie. Yeah. She came down with us in her stroller because she was trying to lay an egg. And as everybody knows, she is steadfast out in the garage. Right. She kind of hangs out there. Yeah. And it's a little too hot. She's got fans out there and everything else. And she was laying an egg in her stroller. Mm-hmm. So we just picked up the stroller and moved down. Yeah, here we just us. carried the stroller down. Yeah. And on the way down, she laid the egg. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I put the stroller down, looked in. I was like, uh, the egg is out. The egg has landed. (laughs) So that did the trick. We just carried her down. And she's just hanging out. She's our live studio audience. So she will have some things to say, I'm sure. She's a good talker. So what's going on around your house? I'm pretending it's not hot. I'm back to that same thing. Do I hate hot weather or cold weather more? I don't know. Whatever season we're in, that's the one I hate Pretty much. My garden is really shaping up, but I realized that in in about two more weeks, I need to start planting for fall crops. (laughs) You're just now getting the other crops in. Like August 1st, there's a bunch of stuff I need to start getting in. (laughs) So, okay. Enjoy the crops that you planted. Indeed. And then, you know, like on the real button, there's one time, two time, three time speed. Yeah. We need to hit you in your gardening so that it goes super fast for you. Oh, my God. The problem is this is the time of year, like if I don't get the gardening done before, say, 10 a.m. or after like 6 p.m., mm-hmm. probably after 7, it's not going to get done. I need yeah. those cool times. I was talking to you last night. I had Periwinkle out on the deck with me and I didn't want to go to the back because it was so hot mm-hmm. in the back at that moment in time. Yeah. So I weeded the back garden and got all the leaves up and everything. Meanwhile, I'm like, oh, I need to get back there. Mm-hmm. If everybody remembers, a while ago, I mentioned I wanted to do wine barrels in the back. Yeah. In front of the containers. Yeah. yeah in front of the big run. I got them and I need to take some of my substrate out of the little run. Uh So that's where I'm going to put it in the bottom of the wine barrel planters. Yeah. Before I plant and put the topsoil on the very top. So that's what I have to be doing too. And like you said, around here in the Mid-Atlantic, you have to do it before 10 or after 6. The heat's bad enough with the humidity. I mean, we are actually the top of the American South. We're below the Mason-Dixon. The The heat, heat, it's the humidity. As it is, the humidity, huh? Yeah. I had one of those moments where I was thinking about what food crops I could grow in my garden. And I looked around and I said, what grows well right here? What do you see all the time? Corn. And I don't know. I see soybeans. Oh, you're more into soybeans than me. But you're right. You have been planting some soybeans. I have. Yeah. I've got two different types going. They shot up immediately. Yeah. And have got multiple sets of leaves already. And that's going to be a fun project. See how that goes. I was all excited because I ended up getting some sunflowers already started Uh for in front of the runs. So I'm pretty psyched about that. I get enough sun back there. You like start. No, I like starts too, but I find it super exciting to grow from seed. Do you like growing from seed? That is like the big thing. And I have to be honest here. 
I'm this girl that's like somebody else started from seed for me and I'm going to plant a little plant. I love starting from seed. I want to, but it makes to me get happy enough, deep down in my soul. To get enough hours in the day for me to do it, it's not always possible. I like going to the mill. Yeah. And I'm like visual. So like when I see something that pops out at me, like... I'm going to have to do some plants with you by seed. I think the bug will bite you too. And oh, I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. It's just the you girls get, right now keep me busy. I know. It doesn't take that long. I'll show you my method. And you get masses of flowers for a fraction of the oh, price. Yeah. Seeds are so much cheaper. I have started in the past. I've done some herb from seed. Uh-huh. But that's kind of the extent that I've done. Yeah. I love going to the nursery and just anything that catches my eye. I'm oh, I, the I know. I spend way too much money that way. They're more, way more expensive. The thing I find with seeds, though, is I can better plan the plants that I can eat and the plants that I can feed to the chickens, too. Oh, so yeah. So as far as that goes, it's Well, great. it's also way more cost effective. Exactly. And my plants right now, I'm just doing chicken friendly in front of the run and what I want to aesthetically for the summer. I'm doing a lot of annuals back there because they're in the wine barrels. Right. So I wanted to look pretty until the first frost. Yeah. Then I can plant something new. We were talking about that today. You were saying how much you like annuals because then you're done and you can do something new. Yeah. My spring annuals will be pretty much pooped out by the beginning of August. And then I will start putting the fall crops where they were. Yeah. And freeing up some space. Yeah. I'll be sad to see my sugar snap peas go, although I'll put in another crop. So will the bunnies. Well, yeah, there's <laughs> gosh, gosh darn rabbits. But when I pull the plants out, they go in the chicken coops for the chickens. They can eat that whole plant. Oh, yeah. We just have a big favor to ask. If you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does really, really good things for our show and our growth. The other thing that helps our show grow so much, I mean leaps and bounds, is hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a show. It's there automatically on drop days. You don't even have to worry about it. You can also tell a friend about the show. You can share your favorite episodes on social media. Head over to our Etsy shop. Check out the t-shirts we have there. You can visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Become a patron of the show. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our show notes, use our affiliate links, and buy products from our sponsors. Yay! Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me just take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you... You need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with the chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the June Box, I absolutely love the embroidered rooster apron and the egg carton stickers. I love those chicken leg bands with charms and the egg cartons that go with those stickers. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your purchase and shipping is always free. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box with at least a three-month subscription. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. Da, 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 it's a time for a bright spotlight. Yes. Are you the singing gondolier from Venice? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a redo, but this is also a relook. It is. Mm -hmm. And this week's breed spotlight is? The leghorn. The leghorn. Leghorn. Or the leghorn. Yes. In certain <laughs> regions of the country, it's a it's leghorn. It's pronounced all different ways, it sure but is. it's the same chicken. Pretty much say leghorn here in our area. That's what we say. Yeah. The leghorn is arguably one of the best known chicken breeds in the world. It really is. Let's and, just say it's probably number one. And almost. it is definitely the best known of the Mediterranean class. And we picked this for a reason. So the Mediterraneans as a class are relatively light-bodied chickens. They're known for their excellent laying, non-setting, active nature, their foraging skills, and... This is the reason we picked this chicken is because they're incredibly, incredibly heat-hardy. And we're going to be talking about that exactly. later during our main topic. 
but this chicken is known for being heat hardy. Absolutely. It comes from a region that is a very, very warm right. region. The Mediterraneans all come from countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea. And that includes Italy and Sicily and mm-hmm. Spain. And the chickens that developed in this region are known, as you said, for being exceptionally heat hardy. Now, they're not as cold hardy, especially in very cold areas with sub-freezing temperatures. Well, the body is a lot smaller. They don't have the mass on them. So insulation or coop heat may be necessary for them. Oh, for sure. But right now we're concentrating on their remarkable heat hardiness and why they are an amazing addition to a backyard farm or homestead in the southern climate. And I can raise my hand right here because I do have one, one and only Lucy, which she's sometimes on our Instagram page. And that little chicken has a big place in my heart. She is small bodied, one tough little cookie. I love Lucy. Yeah. I love Lucy. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, she's definitely that quintessential leghorn looking. Their profile is very distinct. They have that large straight comb and waddles. Mm -hmm. And on the hens, they've got the flop over comb. Yes. And that's what I was saying before. If you can't have a rooster and you want a big comb chicken, this is the hen for you because they have very large combs. They flop over. It's adorable. adorable. Most of the hens in the Mediterranean class have that jaunty flopped over comb. Mm -hmm. The leghorns are also known for that upright tail. That tail is something that stands out when you see it. It's so much different than a lot of the other breeds. Yes. And a lot of the breeds, let's just take the cream crescent leg bars. Mm -hmm. They have that tail also. Right. You can see a chicken that's descended from from the leghorn, how this tail goes in. And it's much different than others. The Egyptian Fayumi is not considered a Mediterranean breed, even though you could actually group them in there from Egypt. But they also have that extreme upright tail. There must be something to do with the hot climate. It's definitely different than other hens. Right. Leghorns also have those yellow legs, mm-hmm. white earlobes, and as we said, the small bodies. Yes. They're, they're, they're little. surprisingly small. So boys are about five to six pounds, hens around four. If you don't have a large space, this might be a chicken for you because urban farmer. Urban yeah. farmer, you can have more of these chickens because they're smaller. Yeah. There are a few steps up from a bantam. They still lay you a full size egg. Oh, some big there, eggs. But they take up a lot less space. The mm-hmm. other thing that we want to touch base on is they do have a reputation for being flighty, but they are very gentle. They and- are. People use flighty as a derogatory description of a chicken. When in reality, it means they have a very developed startle reflex. Yeah. They're kind of twitchy because they keep an eye out for predators. They're very predator savvy. Mm -hmm. When you have this chicken, this is what we say. You get out what you put in. Right. With any chicken. They might still take flight if you startle them. Yeah. But they'll be used to you handling them and you can make them into a huggy chicken. Yeah. Lucy, she loves car rides. She's loved them since she was little. And she's yeah. never, ever been flighty. No, Lucy doesn't startle. Like the family no. startle easy, but Lucy doesn't. Maybe because she's so little, but she's got the big sisters that she feels really safe. Yeah. She really doesn't. That's why I say every single bird's an individual. Well, some of that flightiness, I think, again, we said they're super alert, but they're mm-hmm. also very active. Yes. And that ties on to the fact that they are super good foragers. They will find some food. Let's go into eggs. They're going to lay five plus a week. I call them the top egg layer because I sometimes get six to seven eggs a week. It's hard to argue with that. If there's a rare day that I don't have an egg in there, a white Mm -hmm. egg, I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. I don't know if the Fayumis lay that much, but it's close. And then the leg bars are right behind them. That leg horn's instilled in them. Absolutely. There's turquoise eggs almost every single day. That's one of the major draws to this bird is their laying ability. Right. Now, the hens rarely go broody. That's a good thing in some cases. Mm -hmm. Around the Mediterranean region, they were selected for that. Mm -hmm. Broodiness would interrupt their laying. Mm -hmm. And virtually all the Mediterraneans are not good setters. No, you have to mix in your broodies and your unbroodies or use an incubator. Yeah. The unbroody, you don't have to worry about chasing them out of the box, what right. you're going to do to get them not to be broody. Right. This hen doesn't take a break for being broody. They do take a short break in the winter. They deserve it. I mean, Absolutely. they deserve a break. But that's the only reason why they're taking a break, not to be broody, not for any other reason. Right. So the leghorn is definitely a very old breed of chicken, at least several hundred years old. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to pinpoint just how old at this point. I say the Romans. (laughs) It's possible. (laughs) I mean, the Romans always talk about the five-toed chicken. Yes. Which would not be the leghorn. No. But but these small Mediterraneans, I mean, there's no question that they were a huge part of life in various parts of Italy. They were definitely present in continental Europe by the 1800s. And they were generally known as Italians. That's right. 
if you were migrating, traveling somewhere, they would have been a really good chicken to take with you. Like, Heck yeah. Really small and portable. Small. And they're Catch all the beautiful. Bugs. They're, they're beautiful. I mean, there is something to say about this beautiful all white chicken with a big red flowy comb that's flopping in the wind. Well, it just so happens that the first leghorns that arrived in America were brown. Oh, well. They were brought into port in Connecticut in about 1852. Yeah. But the white leghorns arrived the next year in 1853. They came in at Boston Harbor. Did they have tea with them? I don't know. It's 1853, so this was pre-Civil War. Yeah. By this time, they were generally called leghorns. And we talked about this in episode four. Way back. So they were generally called leghorns because the leghorns came from the Genoese port of Legorno. Legorno. You hear people talk about Livorno, but we really think it's the Genoese name of Legorno that leads to the leghorn. It makes a lot more sense. I always said, if you have a roux that's a leghorn. You should name him Legorno. I would say it. You would be just calling him through the yard. I would love it. Legorno. Legorno. Come here to Legorno. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the newly imported leghorns were instantly popular with Americans. They were really hardy, that great foraging ability, and the egg production that's off the charts. So it wasn't until like 20 years later that they were exported to the UK from the US. Wow. So, yeah, they came from the US. And then they were improved by breeding Menorcas into the lines to Another increase the Another Mediterranean breed. Right. Now, poultry writer Lewis Wright, he imported and bred the leghorns himself. He was a huge fan, and he actually wrote pages and pages about them. Honestly, before I had Lucy, before I had a personal connection to this chicken, Mm -hmm. I would kind of be like, okay, this is another chicken. For me, I could see more leghorns in my flock, definitely. Oh, yeah. And my experience with her is such a little chicken, big piece of my heart, because they're full of charisma. Everything about them just makes you happy. It's a fantastic breed to the point where if you need high egg production, I'm like, why would you be looking anyplace else? I could see why Lewis would write a lot about them. He really loved them. They have such huge personalities for little birds. And he wasn't necessarily a fan of breeding the Menorcas in to make them bigger. He thought that was to the detriment of the breed in the UK. I agree with him Mm -hmm. because I think that's one of the parts that makes them so appealing is that they're a little chicken that lays a normal size egg. Right. And many of them. Yeah. And if you want high egg production and you can only have four chickens, this might be the chicken for you. Oh, heck yeah. And you have a family. You're going to be needing eggs. You're going to be getting a lot of eggs through this. Plus, they are workable chicken. You can work with them. You can teach them. You can get them to love. Well, they love no matter what, but get them to be handled a little bit more. They're a lot of fun to watch, too. Oh, yeah. They're super fun to watch. So the Leghorn was accepted by the American Poultry Association, and they appeared in the Standard of Perfection's first printing in 1874. Does not surprise me. The first colors admitted were single cone black, white, and brown. Okay. The breeders and showers got to work right away, though. They took this chicken, got to work right away, and by 1883, rose cone version of the brown were admitted. Over the next 100 years, 16 different varieties of leghorns were admitted to the APA Standard of Perfection. That's a lot. It's a lot. Americans really like a rose comb. They do. I like the big straight floppy comb. Yeah. I just think it has a certain appeal to it. I love but it. But that comb is smaller. It does serve a purpose in a colder area. Maybe that's the reason why for the upper half of the country. Yeah. That's, it does make some sense. We like big combs and we cannot lie. <laughs> That's one thing I don't understand why to change that comb around. It's known for the comb. It would make sense if it were for weather. I could see that. Let's go over the colors because most people think brown and white for leghorns, right? Oh, yes. But there's so many more. Okay. So let's name them. There's black. Light and dark brown. White. Buff. Silver. Black-tailed red. Colombian. And golden. Did we just blow your mind right, right now? I've never seen here a Colombian table? leghorn. And I actually looked it up and apparently the Colombian leghorn is mostly found out of the U.S. Plus there are other non-APA colors available. Let's go. The red. The cuckoo. The Isabel. Mealy Fleur. The modeled X checker leghorn. And there are bantam versions of the leghorn available. Which I find so funny. I know. I'm like, why well, you got to make this small chicken smaller? But I think that comes out of showing. It does, but hey, if you're an urban chicken keeper, you're like, come on. The modeled exchequer leghorn caught my eye last year. Yes, oh. you talked about that one a lot. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's a beauty. So the leghorn story is very similar to the rest of the heritage breeds with a couple wrinkles. By the early 1900s, leghorns were already being moved towards industrial settings. Boo, hiss. Yeah. They were bred for high production. They already produced massive amounts of eggs but they were being selected for higher production. And then they started to be used heavily as parent stock for industrial hybrid layers. This is another boo-hiss moment. 
So after the two world wars, the Leghorns experienced the same decline that almost every heritage breed had, even though they were still readily available in industrial lines. Right. There were some Leghorn breeders and lovers that did keep the true heritage lives alive, mm-hmm. essentially until we got to the 1970s and conservation work began. Exactly. Yeah. And this is a success story of conservation. It is. It's one of the very most popular backyard chickens that you can get. I was surprised the mill this year did not have leghorns. No. They also may have waited too long to order. They may have been sold out. I was just in another bigger farm chain store the other day with Ella, and we did see leghorns Uh and barred rocks together. Yeah. This used to be a very popular one that would sell out. Oh, yeah. And the reason I got Lucy is because she was like the last one left that no one took, and I was the luckiest person alive to get her. (laughs) Well, the Leghorn is still beloved by Americans and the rest of the world, but they have moved to the recovering category of the Livestock Conservancy's Poultry Conservation List. Yay! (laughs) They're on their way. We don't need to say it again, but we will. They make excellent backyard chickens. They are fantastic homestead layers, especially in the South. And as long as you're not putting them in with flocks where there's already a bully hen in charge, they fit into a mixed flock wonderfully. Lucy is in with my big girls. I know. She's in with... The, uh, that's a hardcore coop, man. <laughs> that's a hardcore She flock. holds her own. And she holds her own. They sometimes get her comb. Yeah. But I always say this, and I've probably said it a million times, but you read everything, and it's like, this is the chicken you need because you're never going to have to feed as much. They can uh. live off of little. Let me tell you something. Every night when that chicken goes up on that roost... Her crop is the biggest crop (laughs) out of everybody, and she gets in there and fights, and she's in a hardcore flock. Oh, they really are. And she holds her own. Mm -hmm. We would 100% recommend this chicken for anybody. Absolutely. I mean, they make very lovable pets if you put the time in with them. They are truly one of our favorite breeds. They're one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. They're wonderful. So where can you find them? You need to find them because you need one lake horn at least for your flock. Yeah, I got the lake bar, but now I need a lake horn. Yes. You can find them almost anywhere these days. The brown lake horns have started showing up in our local farm supply store along with the white. Yeah, Bauman's this year. Exactly. And most hatcheries carry at least the white and brown. Now, Sand Hill Preservation Center. They have several colors available in straight run lots because Sand Hill breeds these birds expecting you're going to buy them in a lot to breed. Well, let's look at their name, their preservation. Exactly. So they're like, look, if you're buying from us, you are going to be breeding. So they maintain several colors, including the black leghorn, which is gorgeous, the bard, the mealy floor, and the exchequer. The exchequer. Oh, so gorgeous. And McMurray Hatchery, one of our favorite hatcheries, Mm -hmm. has the pearl white. They also have the red, silver, and then they have both straight and rose-combed brown leghorns. So I guess if you're in a colder environment, you might want to pick that. It's a smaller rose comb. comb. It's like not the rose comb on, say, the red cap. Yeah. It's more like the rose comb on the Dominique. Yeah, because it's a smaller bird. Right. It's a smaller rose with a little spike on the back. Yeah. To me, it's not going to look like a leghorn unless it's got big floppy combs. I mean, the rose comb leghorns are handsome chickens, but I do miss that Mediterranean floppy. That huge comb. I love it so it's much. It's one of their little things that, yeah. you know, is endearing. We put pictures up of Lucy on our Insta because we have her. Mm-hmm. But if you have Leghorns and you want to share pictures with your beloved Leghorns with us, please do. Mention us in your stories and then we will repost it to ours and show us your babies. We would Absolutely. love to see them. And if you have any of the non-standard colors, especially that X checker or the Millie floor. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the mill floor. I would be like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you get her to me tomorrow, oh, please? So that's a Leghorn revisited. Yes. And sometimes we have to go back. More to say. That's the Leghorn. Are you looking for a vintage small farm feel for your egg packaging this year? Or are you looking to develop a unique brand image with custom packaging? The Egg Carton Store offers a wide variety of recyclable cartons, customizable stamps, poultry care products, and a robust customizing tool to design your own labels. Plus, they offer fast, free shipping on all cartons and labels. Visit eggcartonstore.com for all of your egg carton, label, stamp, and poultry care needs this spring. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, take a look at Roosties Store on Amazon.com. We've personally tested their products and we're huge fans. They have their famous nesting pads, those fantastic chick water and feeder kits, do-it-yourself port feeder kits, water or nipple, and water or cup kits. And you don't even need to drive to the stores. They're all available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. 
visit Amazon.com and check out the Roosties range or follow the link in our show notes. Okay, so let's move on to main topic. Yeah, yeah. This main topic is a direct transition because one of the reasons we chose a Mediterranean breed is because our main topic this week is heat stress. There's a lot going around about heat stress these days. Right. Because we are in July Mm -hmm. and from June till mid-September, it's hot. Yeah. And we need to know what to do. Now, the first thing we should mention is listen to this main topic. Mm -hmm. And if you want to see anything that is in writing, go over to Omelette USA. Blog.omelette.us has our newly published blog post on heat stress in chickens. Prevention is always the key. That's what we want. And we chose the Mediterraneans because one of the best ways to prevent heat stress if you're in a subtropical place is to have a very heat-hardy breed. Yes. If you're in the South, anywhere I'd say right below us, not even below us, Pennsylvania might be the top of it. It's hot in summer, very hot and humid, which takes a toll on these birds. And even where I am, which is, you know, 45 minutes north of you, Mm -hmm. even where I am, I think the temperatures are a little lower. And so my Brahmas do fantastic in the winter, but the summer's harder on them. I said this the other week, we have the luxury of sweating. Right. They do not. Chickens do not have sweat glands. They do not have that. And their bodies are covered with feathers, Mm -hmm. which don't allow a lot of area. super insulating. When we talk about the leghorn, that comb serves a purpose in the heat. Right. And we talked about it in combs and waddles a few weeks ago. Right. So one of the hallmarks of the Mediterranean is the large comb and waddles. And that was developed. They evolved with that huge comb and waddle to help regulate their body temperature. So essentially, blood moves through the unfeathered skin. Mm -hmm. And it's cool because there are so many blood vessels so close to the surface of the skin. Right. So, I mean, it does make sense that they would evolve with those huge combs in such a warm area. Well, that's why they have them. When you have a big, huge chicken with a little tiny comb Brahma. in a big heat area, yeah. that's a problem. Yep. They don't have a lot of area of skin to expel that heat. Right. So there are certain things that we need to do by cooling their internal temperature mm-hmm. to help them feel more comfortable. So let's start with symptoms and things that you should look for if your bird's going to be heat stressed. Yeah. The reality is that chickens stressed by heat can decline very quickly. So knowing what you're looking at and then putting prevention in place is key. So the first symptom is open mouth breathing. That's a way of taking heat out. Dogs do it by panting. Panting. Mm -hmm. It's panting in chickens also. Chickens have a telltale sign, which is they put their wings out because that's another place Mm -hmm. they can expel heat is in that skin area under the wings. So they hold the wings straight out to try to get air up there. Yeah. As the heat stress progresses, they may become lethargic with pale comb and waddles. That's the key word is lethargic. They will be laying down. They will not be doing normal chicken things. They will not be eating and drinking, which is not good. Right. So if you see these things... You need to immediately move your chicken to a cool area. Yes. You can put their feet in some cool water. Yes. You offer them water with electrolytes in it. You really want to get some water in them. But the biggest thing is get them in an area where the temperature is lower. If you're seeing these signs out in a run outside, you need to bring them in the house, in the air conditioning immediately. Yeah. They need to go somewhere where it's more than 10 or 15 degrees cooler than where they are. Try to get some water into them. Mm -hmm. Water in them. Yeah. Even while you're trying to, you can have them in a cool foot bath while you're giving them all these things, electrolytes by mouth. You can syringe some cool water with electrolytes in it. The side of their beak is the minimally stressful thing. If you're a practiced chicken person, you can squirt it right in their beak if you know what you're doing. Also, you can have a little syringe just with cold water and trinkle it all over their comb, their waddles. Mm -hmm. These things will help bring the internal temperature down. Right. This is why we talk so much that we don't want broody hens in the summer. Oh, heck no. And about breaking them and why we have to break them in the summer because it's way too hot to be sitting in a nest box for any length of time. I know too many stories about broody hens who have died in nest boxes in the summer. Yeah, it's no fun. And that's the sad double-edged sword on this. That increase in temperature makes them want to go broody Mm -hmm. and then having fans in the coops also can help circulating air. So let's go into prevention because mm-hmm. prevention is the main thing that we want to talk right. about. Right. Treating is harder. Preventing is where you want to start. We put Gertie to sleep. She's like, you're all boring talking about those leg horns. <laughs> so the first thing is shading cool dirt. And that goes all the way back to siting your coop before you get your chickens. So today it's really hot and Buttercup is back 
under the coop in that really soft dirt that everyone knows you have under your coop because right. it never gets wet and digging down deep because she's a larger chicken. Right. That's what you want to see. Right. The further they can dig down, if it's shady, the dirt is cool. Yes. And that's my Brahmas. That's their big thing. Having shade in your run, even if it's a small spot where they can move to. Having shade sails above. If yeah, you don't, shade cloth, any of that, sail cloth. I am thinking about getting some shades that go up and down for the front of my big run. Right. That way, when the sun is so hot in the summer, I can put those yeah, down. Yeah, it's a good way to block it. At a minimum, they need to have shade under the coop if possible because that's that soft, cool dirt they can dig down into. A good reason to have your coop up is because it gives them shelter from everything. Rain, yep. snow, and heat. Yeah. When yeah. you think about it, it creates a shady spot. It does. So having an elevated coop can definitely help with preventing these different things. So the other really important thing to utilize shade for is their water. You don't oh, want yeah. a water sitting out in direct heat. I usually go out and change it twice with ice cold water. And yeah. If you can't do yeah. that, the shade is very important. Yeah. You can drop ice cubes into it to help cool it down. Frozen water bottles that are recycled. Yeah. I do this a lot when it gets to be at the end of July and early August when mm -hmm. it's the hottest. I take the small water bottles that the girls drink. I refill them. And I put them in the freezer and then I put them in the water bowl itself. And it's a bigger ice cube. Yeah. So you can also do that with like a shallow basin of water. They can get in there and get their feet wet. The Brahmas also like I, to do that. I have kiddie pools. Yeah, you can do that. That mm -hmm. I put out. If you're using metal water buckets or metal waterers, they either have to stay in the shade or you have to swap them out in the summer. The other thing is if you're using the plastic cover waterers, that's going to have to be swapped out also. Yeah. It contains heat in there. If it's in shade, that's good. But if the sun hits it at all, it's going to yeah. heat up inside. If you can, switching at least once midday. Yeah. Or around yeah. 2 or 3 o'clock. And then the evening, it's a little cooler. So the other thing is fans. Fans. We are huge fans of fans. <laughs> the thing with fans is you need to make sure that the grate is small enough that oh, yeah. beaks and feet cannot get into it. They're curious. They want to well, know what it is. I mean, I will tell you about... Last year's pullets, I went out and opened the coop last summer, and there was a leg bar riding the oscillating fan. They are curious. They want to know yes. if something looks fun. It looks different. Yeah. They're like, what is so this? Got it. And we've actually switched our oscillating fans out to a brand called Vornado. And we put one fan in the middle of each coop and aim it at the ceiling, and it bounces the cool air throughout the right. coop. It works super well. In our smaller coops, like our plastic coops, we use rechargeable battery-powered fans. And what they do is suck the air through. Oh, yeah. They pull the air straight through and keep those coops from just becoming a, a hot box. Yeah, and the other thing is using frozen containers of water in there. Exactly. To act as, basically, it acts as a cooler. It's going to cool the inside. Right. You take advantage of the insulating properties of the coop. We generally put them in a Ziploc bag or we wrap them in a towel to keep nasties off of them. Yeah. Because once they melt, you're going to pop them back in your freezer. If I don't do that, I just rinse them with the hose afterwards. I suppose you could do that. And then I clean them and then I put them back in the freezer. Because, again, you're putting this from the coop to the freezer. Exactly. The coop to the freezer. So but you want to keep it as clean as possible. It's a great system. The first time we tried it, we sort of did an experiment. We put two cold packs in one of our omelet cube coops. Yeah. And Pete went out an hour or two later and checked it, and it was substantially cooler. Yeah. Like you could put your hand in and feel the difference. Well, the plastic coops are more like a cooler. Yeah, That's much how more they, insulated. It's yeah. way more insulated. Yep. So if you think about it, it's holding heat in. But if you put something cold, it's going to hold that cold in exactly. also. Yeah. So it works very well. It works well. Doing these things will go a long way for prevention. Yeah. The other thing is to cool from inside via what we're giving them. Right. That means hydrating snacks. That means things that are frozen, that are cold from the fridge. Really, any juicy fruit or vegetable will work. Yes. As long as it's something that's safe for poultry to eat. Yes. But melon is our go-to. It is. Think about it. Melons are like 80 to 90% water. Right. But melons also contain a lot of good vitamins and minerals, and they contain electrolytes. Yes, they do. Specifically lycopene. Yes. So we found a study back in 2018 that found that lycopene helped prevent some of the effects of heat stress in chickens. Because it's an electrolyte. Exactly. So it's a fascinating study. We've linked it in the show notes. It was poultry specific. The other thing that I like to do is I feed crumble. Mm-hmm. Pulling my crumble out and putting it in big bags and putting it in the freezer and the fridge. And when I put my food out, 
it's cold food. It'll be cool for a while, yeah. Yeah, so in the morning when they're eating it, it's going to help bring down that temperature or save that and switch out your food midday. Right. And put the cold food out all those times when it's super hot and you need something to cool them from inside. Right. So what you're putting in is everything cold. When you think about it, if you want them to eat their food, make it cold. Yeah. I am growing a variety of melon this year. It's a cantaloupe, but it's called the Minnesota Midget. Oh, yeah. You've been talking about that. Yeah. So I'm growing it in a container because I just don't have a place big enough for it to sprawl out. And it's going to go on a trellis. Anyway, that's a perfect small space plant that both you and your chickens can benefit from. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's fantastic. That was the other one was cantaloupe was also high in lycopene. Yeah. When we Watermelon were doing the is research. the highest, but cantaloupe is probably the second. Yes. And of the two, cantaloupe's my favorite. I think you're more of a watermelon girl, aren't you? No, I love cantaloupe. Do you? Okay. But watermelon and cantaloupe are kind of neck and neck. So uh-huh. yesterday, I cut a watermelon. I leave a little extra on all the rinds. I do too. And I put it in the freezer. Mm-hmm. So yesterday they got some and then this morning they got the frozen. Okay. They kind of look at it first like, are you kidding me? And then they jump in. Yeah. I cut this watermelon and I put it in a big bowl. By the end of the night, the watermelon's almost gone. And I'm like, I think I ate the whole thing myself. You ate it. Would you keep going back for more? Yeah. That's yeah, good. But zero points, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're full of lycopene. <laughs> I'm getting power to keep gardening. The chickens are like, eat more watermelon. Give us more rind. Yeah. But they get all the rind. And I eat always leave like an inch on there. I am very generous with the way I cut my cantaloupes. I get plenty. The chickens get plenty. I see a lot of people, they just buy a watermelon. And sometimes I do that when it's really hot, like a chicken watermelon. I've done it too. But there's no reason why we can't share. Yeah. You know, I mean, all of us. So it's one of those things. Here's the other thing. We do this breed spotlight every week. Mm -hmm. The reason we picked this one is because this chicken is the number one heat hardy chicken. Exactly. So choose a breed that works for your climate. Right. Do the research yeah. on it. We all get chickens for very different reasons. Oh, and yeah. all of them are legitimate. Yeah. But if you're trying to go for food security and permaculture systems and maybe cut down on your energy usage, it does make sense to get breeds that work in your climate. Oh, yeah. Again, our climate has two extremes, so we're kind of smack in the middle of trouble. So we can't pick one way or the other because we have extremely cold, but we're not like Minnesota, not the so Dakotas. Hard. We're not there, but in the summer, I feel like we're right there with Florida. Oh, heck yeah. It can be brutal here. It's brutal. So we need a chicken that's heat hardy. Mm -hmm. And smaller body chickens are generally Mediterranean breed chickens. But doing the research, every week when we put a breed spotlight Mm -hmm. out, we generally always try to tell you if these chickens are heat hardy or cold hardy. Yes. And listening to that for your area, that's the number one prevention right there. Right. And having everything that you're going to need basically having some vegetables, a refrigerated area to refrigerate them, fans. They're easy preventative measures. Right. And just as a reminder, if you're not sure if your chicken is suffering from heat stress, call a veterinarian and check in with them. And the number one thing is bring them in the AC as soon as you can and then call the vet. Because what we call heat stroke is not a true stroke. No. I mean, it's essentially your chicken's body is shutting down because of the excess heat. Right. So number one is preventative. We can't stress that enough. We wish you all a moderately cool summer. <laughs> yeah, we wish, man. <laughs> right? <laughs> wish ourselves a moderately or cool summer. Or can we just pack up all of our chickens and all of our animals and just go sit on the beach with umbrellas? Oh, with the breeze. With the breeze. Oh. The shade from the umbrellas. You know who else is really heat hardy, just as an aside? The Nankin bantams. Bantams in general, in general yes. are because they're smaller bodies. Yeah, the Nankins don't sweat it, man. Okay, let's move into... Cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. And today's recipe, we are going with a lavender whiskey sour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so a little history geek out. <laughs> the whiskey sour first appeared in 1862 in print. It was in Jerry Thomas's Bartender Guide. Jerry Thomas. Jerry Thomas. I don't know who Jerry Who's Thomas Jerry is. Who's Jerry Thomas? But I know that it was 1862 and there was whiskey sour. It was a very simple recipe. It was basically egg white, simple syrup, lemon juice, and whiskey. There you go. There you go. So this is essentially our herb-infused version of a whiskey sour. And you've been wanting to do something with the lavender. If anybody follows us on Instagram, you know that I'm kind of a lavender geek. Oh, I love lavender. I have a lavender farm that's within 15 minutes of my house. I feel so grateful and lucky that this farm exists so closely to my house. And every year you go and you can buy tickets for multiple hours sit and cut lavender and the farm makes lavender lemonade lavender cookies lavender ice cream it's very cool and they sell all the different lavender stuff including 
different cooking lavender spices already dried and everything. So I'm like, we got to work lavender in. <laughs> What you're going to do is make a simple syrup with lavender, sugar, and lemon juice. Yes, you are. And essentially, to make the drink, it's going to be your whiskey of choice. Yeah. If you use bourbon, you can use vodka. Yeah. So to make the syrup, you're going to take a little saucepan. You're going to combine a cup of sugar, a cup of water, and one and a half tablespoons of lavender buds. Yes. And while I was at the farm, the farmer was telling me that the English lavender is the one that we should be using. Did she name any particular cultivar or is it pretty widespread? It's pretty widespread. Nice. She just said English lavender. That's what you want to use for your lemonade, for your cookies, okay. for your drinks. You're going to put the water and the sugar in that saucepan. You're going to cook it over medium until the sugar has dissolved. Right. Then you add the lavender buds and you let it steep for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Pour it through a strainer to get rid of the lavender buds. It's almost like you're making a tea. Exactly. You're going to stir in a little bit of lemon juice since it's uh, whiskey sour. Yep. And then the drink itself is super easy to make. You're going to use two ounces of whiskey, a tablespoon of your lavender syrup, and one fresh egg white. Egg white is a traditional ingredient in whiskey sour recipes. Yes, it is. So you're going to put all that in a shaker. You're going to shake it. It's going to make it really cold. And then you're going to add ice and you're going to shake it again. And then you're going to pour it into a champagne coupe or a whiskey glass. You can garnish it with some lavender buds if you want. The egg white will come to the top. Yep. It it's makes frothy. it foamy. Yeah. And then you're going to go out and get your kiddie pool. And you're going to put, put your chickens in it okay. and your feet. Yeah. And you're going to put a little purple umbrella in your drink and enjoy. It's so aromatic. It's a very sensory drink. Lavender, I just love it because it does take a lot of the senses. To look at it, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. To smell it, it smells so good. I do find it very relaxing. It is calming. It's one of those calming scents. I love it. Anything I've tried with it, I love the taste. Oh, yeah. It's also a beautiful color. I did put lavender in my garden and with my roses and herbs, and it just, it's taking off. It loves the sun. So the farm that's near me does sell little cuts of their plants mm -hmm. for $3. That's good, I think that's it's a good so price. cheap. Yeah, it is. So I bought one, which will be planted back in the wine barrels, back with the chickens, uh -huh. so that we can all enjoy it. We're going to get the kiddie pool out, both of us, put our feet in. Take some photos of that. Heck yeah. <laughs> if you have any other drink ideas that include eggs or egg whites, yeah. let us know. Let us know your variations. We would love it. Okay, so now it's about that time we move into retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. This week's Retail Therapy, we have a fun guest, Rebecca Marshall. She is here today to tell us what is new in her Etsy store. And let me tell you, there's a lot. So cute. Enjoy. Welcome. Hi. <laughs> so welcome back, Nice Rebecca. to be here. <laughs> We're so happy to see you, sweet friend. You do such amazing work. It makes me happy to see your stuff. And you. Oh, thank <laughs> so you. So we have a couple of things to talk about as far as your work goes, but let's get the important stuff out of the way. Do you have any new chickens? Yes, <laughs> we have a, a surprise chicken. So she belonged to someone up the road, a friend of mine, and they couldn't keep her anymore because apparently she was too noisy and was upsetting the neighbors. So we got her, but she's not that noisy. My, my hens are quite noisy. So mine are too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, hens talk. Do you know what breed she is? She's a speckledy. But she's very sweet. She's very friendly. But the only problem is, is that I've got 10 chickens plus this speckledy. So they're separated by a fence. And I'm not sure. How long have you been trying to integrate her? About two weeks. Yeah, it'll take yeah, a little longer. Yeah, yeah well. I mean, they'll get there. Sometimes some of the other ones fly into her run section and hang out for a bit. So I'm just kind of leaving that. Yeah, yeah. that's good. And also I've got some Splash Morans on order. Ooh, nice. so, those are very pretty. Yeah. So I'm thinking when they come, I could maybe put them with her as a three. It's always yeah. easier with more than one chicken. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Gertie's still on the outs because she's the one chicken. <laughs> so they'll never accept poor Gertie back in. Aww. I keep trying, but I know how it is with one chicken. If you have three, it might be a little easier. Gertie has some alternative housing options that will be coming up. So. <laughs> so we really wanted to talk to you today because you have recently launched essentially a clothing line. Yeah, it's really exciting. We're excited. Yeah, the, <laughs> the first photo that we saw, I, I believe it's your daughter in it. Yes, and she's, right, yeah. she's wearing a little skirt and she has on a t-shirt with bunting and a silky on it. And it's like the cutest thing I've ever seen. Thank you. So we've got a whole range for children and a whole range for adults, men and women. And there's also a few tote bags on the website. 
and some prints. Oh, I should say there's two websites. So it's really, it is confusing. So there's the Etsy shop and then there's the clothing shop. Mm-hmm. So the clothing shop has got the clothes and a few extra bits, but the Etsy shop has got everything else on it. I can't combine them at the moment, but I, I you know, one day, hopefully. <laughs> hey, I love having two destinations for Rebecca Marshall. <laughs> that is not a bad thing. In the show notes, I will put a link to your Etsy shop Thank where you. people can find almost everything, your art prints, all of that sort of thing, and then a link to the clothing shop. Great. You know, in our recording studio is part of my basement that we're making our own. We actually have a bar. So I've been eyeing up your martini glass and chicken print. It would be perfect. <laughs> All the hens in the, in the, the glass. For the chicken bar. It would Definitely. be perfect. So let's start out with the clothing because this is the new part. What inspired you to come out with a clothing line? Well, I think everyone likes chickens on clothes. I had thought about it ages ago, but what was stopping me was I wanted to get the right clothing company to do it. Right. And then I found this company called T-Mills who are based on the Isle of Wight. And the whole factory is run on renewables and everything they make is with organic fabrics or recycled papers and things like that. And the packaging they send out is all paper card. So there's no sort of plastics involved. They're a perfect company to work with, really. So when I found them, I thought, right, okay, we can do this now. Whereas before, there was a lot of other companies where the quality wasn't right, and I wanted it to be nice. So, If you buy one of these t-shirts or sweatshirts, you are wearing a piece of art that Rebecca has hand-painted herself. Yeah, the fabric, a print. And the fabric is top quality. Some of it's definitely organic. Is all of it organic? It's all organic, yeah. All organic. That That's is a major plus. Organic cotton, which is usually higher quality. You don't deal with all the pesticides that yeah. come from conventionally grown cotton. I love this. And for the person who loves the egg color chart, I'm just looking at this t-shirt with all the different egg colors on it. That's like your science-based chicken lady right there. Or somebody who just loves the rainbow eggs. Yeah. It's so yeah. cute. Your prints are beyond beautiful. And I see you have some ducks on here too. Chickens and ducks. Yeah. And actually the, the mini duck keeper one for kids sells, a, yeah, I sell a lot of that one, the mini duck oh, keeper. Oh, yeah. Wow. It is adorable. They're all adorable. The mini chicken keeper. I need that one for magpie. My kids have got those and they're just adorable. I love the mini chicken keeper stuff. Yeah. I mean, the the mini chicken keepers here are multiple days a week doing all the chicken chores. So (laughs) there you go. (laughs) Let's look at some of the men's wear because I want to get my husband something. The men's folk need some chicken stuff. Chief egg collector. That's adorable. That is so cool. Now, when you get the t-shirts, the colors that you show online are the colors that you get and what's on that print, correct? Yeah. When you look on their website, you click on the item, the design that you love. When you go on there, there's a number of color options per item. You can then change the color of your t-shirt, sweatshirt. Then also there's a lot of different options for sort of relaxed fit t-shirt, fitted t-shirt. There's some boxier sweatshirts. There's a hoodie, normal sweatshirt. There's a few different options. Nice. And for the kids, you have the stickers. Those are big for notebooks, for everything else. I like the colors. They're very sort of earthy, softer colors. I really love your color scheme in this. It's classic chicken lady. (laughs) That's what we're going to title it. And generally, when you have the prints on the shirt, you also have it in corresponding prints and art, which is nice. So if you like a print, you can get it as a print or you can check to see if you have it in the clothing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over and look at tote bags because you can't have too many tote bags. Your oh, rock is so cute. The hen and vegetable tote bag is beyond adorable. I, oh, my heaven. Your oh. web- website is so well done. It's one of those we call mm-hmm. the destination website. <laughs> you're sitting there in the chair and you're like, oh, I have a few minutes. What do I do? You want to go look at some really pretty stuff. Put it in the cart. Always have your wallet right there so you can just <laughs> check out. <laughs> it's so beautiful. I love the new clothing on. Thank you. There's a few other options that I'm not tapping into yet. There's things like t-shirt dresses and other things I need to look into, especially for kids. Like my daughter, I know she'd love to have something like that to wear. Those things are easy. Like right now in the summer, Holly and I sitting here, we have on like just a simple sundress because it's the easiest thing. It's the easiest thing. I finished the barn work. I just want to throw on something light and a t-shirt dress with a chicken on it. Perfect. Hoodie (laughs) growth. There's That's the print you like in the hoodie. And the navy blue hoodie right there. So if you're at your computer or your phone while you're sitting here listening with us, go on the website and look along with us. You're going to love, love, love these prints on this clothing and organic cotton 
You yeah, can't yeah, go wrong. It's so nice. it's so I love soft. that it's produced on the Isle of Wight. I'm one of the weird, probably few Americans who has vacationed on the Isle of Wight. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> my sister and I went. We just finished college. It was before we yeah. started graduate school. And so we went on vacation and stayed several days on the Isle of Wight. And we loved it. Yeah, it's great. It's really pretty. It's- it's a really great factory up there that they know they're doing amazing stuff. I just hope they start expanding a bit more so I can offer more and more <laughs> different yeah. things. So which is your favorite right now? I really like the Grow Good Things. Yes. That's, that's, that's the one Holly's rolling over. Yes. Mm-hmm. Loving that. It's fantastic. I that's also like the Poppy in a Pansy hat one, the White Sussex. Yes. Hat. I think that's my favorite. <laughs> Oh, that's beyond adorable. That's so cute. Grow good things. And the chicken's right in there with all the fruits and vegetables. I love that so much. It's giving me goosebumps. I adore that. And your artwork, as usual, is on point and beautiful. Mm. You do such a great job. How's your garden this year, Rebecca? Busy. Yeah. Really busy. Yeah. I've been out there this afternoon hacking at stuff. (laughs) 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 We've had just had so much rain and then now just sun. So Mm -hmm. everything's just gone absolutely mad. I'm experimenting with dye plants this year. I've got quite a lot of dye plants coming up. So nice. Do you tell I am a very long time fiber artist. Yeah. And I, I also grow dye plants because I keep sheep. So I dye a lot of my own wool. What are you oh, growing wow. dye plant wise? So I've got woad and weld mm-hmm. and dyes coreopsis. Yeah. And hopi sunflowers. Nice. I think there's more, but that's all I can think of right now. I tried to grow indigo and it didn't work this year, which is a shame. Were you trying to grow the regular indigo or the Japanese indigo? Japanese. Okay. Yeah, that's the one that I've grown. I don't think our part of Maryland has a long enough growing season for the regular indigo farrow, okay. but the Japanese yeah. indigo I've had pretty good luck with. So I've grown Japanese indigo in pots for three years before, and it's always been brilliant, but I've never had time to do anything with it because I've always had the baby, young yep. children. Uh, and this year I was like, right, I'm going to dye things this year. And then it's just none of it germinated. I waited oh. for so long, like on heat mats. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, so many sprays, so nothing happened. So I just decided, oh, well, you've got enough to be getting on with. I don't know how easy it is to find in the UK, but in years where I just couldn't do the indigo for whatever reason, I bought crystallized indigo. Okay, yeah. And yeah. it's been freeze dried essentially. And you just mix it up with hot water and add your oxygen reducer and it works beautifully. I might give that a go then, yeah. Yeah, you still get those incredible blues, but you don't have to struggle with that bad smelling. Yeah, I heard it's quite smelly. It's a little stinky. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it does clear out pretty quickly. And it's worth it to get those blue colors. Yeah, definitely. So I want to go back a little bit away from the clothing for a second and just reiterate that Rebecca also has the Etsy store, right? which has all of our favorites. I'm noticing the letter prints. Those are so cool. Every individual letter with a yeah. chicken. Go check out the N in the alphabet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's in New Hampshire. Pretty. Yep. Yeah. I do have a napkin one though. It's not that. I know I you do. Up. I've seen the napkin. Yeah. Rebecca's also your spot for note cards that are gorgeous. That you wanna, yeah, that you want to yeah. send a friend a special note. Hey, we should be doing more of that these yeah, days, definitely. going back to our roots. Nice cards and your mugs, which are, of course, so cute. And then your prints. And you have wrapping paper, too. You have it mm-hmm. on with, have with everything paper, yeah. on it. You cannot go wrong with Rebecca Marshall. I cannot say that enough. I know. It's absolutely fabulous. So I know you gave us two, the Grow Good Things and the Pansy Hat. Are there any other designs that you've recently come up with that are really stand out? No, I think those are my favorite ones at the moment. I've got other designs that are not yet on anything. Okay. I need to get on to And I love the rainbows. Your artwork is beautiful. Look at that wrapping paper. With the cochins and the tulips. I know a I best mean, friend who should get that oh, I guess, for a best they, friend's gift. Are, are they meant to be Pekins or standard cochins? Pekins, I think. That's what the okay. reference photo is, a Pekin, yeah. I would not want to open up a package with that on I it. know. You'd want I to would be like paper. taking the tape and the little scissors trying to get it. <laughs> people do frame it. I get uh, messages from people saying that we just framed it. <laughs> I could see that. I could definitely see that. Or it's I so would, different. It's I gorgeous. I would like, use it maybe like for a journal cover or something because it's so pretty. I've also had people say that they're framing tea towels. I uh, see that. I've yeah. never used mine. And I've I never think- used mine either. Yeah. I've told this story before. It's like the Italian house over here. Like when I grew up, you had the guest towels that no one touched. They were only for when company came over and still, yeah. I think the company was afraid to use them, but <laughs> you know, yeah. 
I put the tea towels on the front of the oven and some of the kids will come, their friends will come in and they'll be like trying to go wipe their hand on my tea towel. I'm like, (gasps) (laughs) that is for decoration only. Were you not brought up in an Italian household here? (laughs) Not touch the towels. (laughs) But yeah, it's art. You don't touch it. One of my friend's mums, she's the first, well, first time I'd really heard of it. She's like, yeah, it's my decoration tea towel. It's always by the, on the Arga, but we don't use it. (laughs) Exactly. That's right. Exactly. That's right. And then you see this child with wet hands going towards you like, oh, no. let's give information where we can find you. So again, I'll have links in the show notes, but on Etsy, you're under Rebecca Lee Artist. Mm-hmm. And then the clothing website is? It's RebeccaMarshallArtist.tmail.com. Okay. So RebeccaLeeMarshall.com for all of the really adorable clothing. The, the children's line is just exquisite. I'm just so in love with all these. Oh, and it just so happens that we know someone who's having a baby. Dr. Rebecca. She's due at the end of August. Yeah. She's going to have all the chicken-themed baby stuff. We've already given her some, but she (laughs) she needs more. It was hard to find chicken onesies for boys. Okay. For everyone out there who has five minutes and wants to take a little mental vacation, go to Rebecca Marshall's website or her Etsy or both and shop for a few minutes. Beautiful original designs by the artist herself. So you're supporting a small business. Again, that organic cotton produced on the Isle of Wight in this really sustainably minded factory. I don't really see a downside to any of this. There is incredible. (laughs) So yeah, we want to thank you again for coming on and chatting with us. It's always nice to talk with you. Lovely to chat. Thank you, Rebecca. We'll see you later. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay, should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we're going to do a listener request for our breed. It's the Brabanter. Yes, we are. They're absolutely adorable chickens. They're really cute. Our main topic is our monthly roundtable with Fiona. We're going to talk about all the ways you can preserve eggs. I can't wait to have Fiona harvest. Back. Yeah. Our recipe is a veggie pack strata. One of my faves. So good. And for Retail Therapy, we're reviewing a beautiful book called Literary Chickens. And we're going to be reading it with our lavender sours. Yes. (laughs) Sounds good, really. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget, we'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.